Shalom and welcome once again to this teaching from Messianic Delaware. My name is Jerry Mitchell, and I want to welcome you to Matthew chapter 5, part 5 this time. Hopefully I will get to the end of uh, this chapter. And I'm going to try and do this very quickly, but as concisely as possible. We've got a lot of, of information to cover, and I think you will be surprised where some of this information may come from that I'm going to use today. Very, very quick review. The disciples, we know, were the only ones present there. Yeshua tells them what it is needed to be content, what it takes to be blessed, and he tells them that he can be trusted. Then he tells them that complete obedience to the Father brings persecution from the world. If you're going to follow Yeshua, you're going to be looked at by the rest of the world as someone they don't want to see because they you then stand for their ethics. You stand for something that, that they know that they're not ready for. Okay. Then he begins to challenge what the Pharisees are teaching. And as he challenges what they're teaching, he, he points out that he is digging through the language, the culture, and the history to tell them they've got to do the same thing. You've got to understand what was written and what's being done because there's a difference here. And now as we continue in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, he says, Again, you've heard it said by them of old that you will not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Now, not every translation is the same on this. And I don't want to get into that right now, but let's go back to Exodus 20, verse 7, and see what it really says. In Exodus 20, verse 7, you will not take the name of, your, of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, vain here means empty. You don't use his name for empty things. It, it, it's not like today we think of people gussing. This, is, this goes far beyond that. It's, it's far beyond that. Jehovah himself uses the, the word, as I live, and that was the oath. As Jehovah lives, we will do these things. He himself used this very promise. And, and you know, he says, if as I live, I will do this. So let's keep looking. Let's see what we're, what we're dealing with here. Leviticus 19.12, You'll not swear by my name falsely, neither shall you profane the name of God. I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. In Numbers uh, chapter 30, verse 2, If a man vows a vow unto the Lord, or swears an oath to bind his soul with a bond, you will not break his word. And he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Deuteronomy 23, 21, Then you will uh, vow a vow to the Lord your God, you will not slack to pay it. It means you're going to do it right away. If the Lord your God will surely require it of thee, it would be a sin in thee if you if you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Ecclesiastes uh, 5, 4 and 5. When you vow a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which you have vowed. Better is it that you should shouldest not vow, than you will vow a vow and not to pay it. Now, this isn't let's make a deal with God. I don't know how many times I've heard people say Lord, if you'll do this for me, I'll do this. He doesn't work that way, okay? That's not, that's, let's make a deal. This is all about, if you make a promise, do what you say you're going to do. But let's, let's dig into this and see what's going on. <clears throat> In verse 33 of the International Children's Version, you've heard that it was said of our people long ago, when you make a promise, don't break your promise. Keep the promises that you made to the Lord. Well, let's play what if here. We've got a lot of information, but let's play what if. What if there could be a translation that better matched all of these Torah and, and, and Tanakh writings? Here I have it in the Hebrew, and the word I want to, to concentrate on is Be'ez Shemi. 
And this comes from the Hebrew Matthew, Matthew of Gospel by George Howard. The original manuscript is dated to approximately mid-14th century or around 1350 A.D. Yes, there's a Hebrew copy of Matthew. Actually, uh, there are several now, 98 that I know of that have been recovered. And they all date various dates. They are from various places around the world. They are, uh, all, and they all agree, they're not all exactly the same. They, they, they weren't copied with the same care because this was a letter from Matthew. So they all weren't copied with the same care as we look at like the Aleppo Codex would be. But they are all primarily the same. There are very, 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 very few differences in them, and most of that is just in the handwriting. Okay? And this version says, Again, you've heard it said to those of long ago, You will not swear Bashami by my name falsely, but you shall return to the Lord your oath. Now, I find this interesting that Yeshua would, would use this quote, and I think it, it pretty much agrees more with what we see in the Old Testament. You will not swear by my name falsely. Now, that doesn't mean uh, a curse. That doesn't mean you're cussing. That doesn't mean anything other than if you say, as the Lord lives, as Jehovah lives, as God lives, as God is my witness then you go do the things you say you're going to do. Okay, That's what it means, because to take his name in vain, to, to use his name with an empty promise, that is what you don't do. Verse 34, But I say to you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. And we see this in Isaiah 66, Thus saith the Lord, heaven is my throne. Verse 35, we're going to continue this very quickly. Nor by the earth, for it is, it is my footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now, there's several places in Scripture he uses, uh, he describes the earth as his footstool. In, in Psalm 48, 2, it says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth uh, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Okay? In Matthew 5, 36, he says, Neither shalt swear by thy head, because it can't, uh, you can't make one hair on your head black or white. Now, what he's referring to here, he's going back to Job 38. I'm not going to take the time to read all of it. Job 38 is where he talks about hanging the constellations. Can you do this? Can you do that? No, it was me who did this, Job, not you. I've got this. Don't worry about it, Job. Okay, that's Job 38. Don't swear by yourself, because you can't do anything. In verse 37, let your communication yes mean, yes no mean, no, for what's, whatever is more than these cometh of evil. Now let's go back here just a little bit and see in Proverbs 19, uh, chapter 10, verse 19 to 20. In the multitude of words, in many words, you might not want to sin, but he that refrains his lips is wise. So use few words. Let your yes mean yes, let your no mean no. The tongue of the just is as, is as choice silver. Okay? If you can be trusted, this, this goes along with your reputation. If you can be trusted, your reputation precedes you. Okay? Your yes means yes, your no means no. You do what you say you're going to do. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. Now we see, we're going to see later in, in chapter 23... Yeshua speaking to the Pharisees, he says, You sit on the seat of Moses, but you don't do anything to help anybody. And, and he chastises them fiercely here. I mean, he, he really condemns their actions. He says, You sit on the seat of Moses, but you won't lift a finger to help anybody. And he's pointing out in verse 5, that if you tell somebody you're going to do something for them, then do it for them. Do it for them. Don't waste precious time and energy on empty promises and, and just wasted air. 
In verse 38, you've heard it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, in Exodus 21, 24, it says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Leviticus 24, breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Now, the problem is we don't keep reading with these things. We stop where it's comfortable for us to stop, where it's convenient for us to stop. We stop too often when we are satisfied. Yes, this agrees with what I'm thinking. Well, guess what? A lot of times these are examples, and we need to keep reading to find out if what we're thinking really is the example being used, or if the example that we want to use isn't exactly what we think it means. In verse 39 it says, But I say to you, Resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn the left cheek also. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Now, in Isaiah, verse 50, or I'm sorry, chapter 50, verse 6 and 7, it says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. I hid my face not from them, for the, from the spitting. And we know what this is all about. This is about when he's standing, uh, being judged before Pilate. But, Yeshua is our example, right? Yeshua is our example. And I need to point out here two things. Strong's doesn't agree that the word to resist evil, but does it make sense? Now, now we look back at the Greek and we say, okay, we see that we shouldn't resist evil. What does that mean? Now, I'm going to tell you that in George Howard's Hebrew Matthew, it doesn't say resist the Hebrew word there means to repay or to pay back. And Yeshua uses this, uh, this analogy often about paying back debts as we forgive our debtors. Does that sound familiar? He uses that analogy often. So don't think of it as, as resisting or, or hiding from evil, avoiding evil. You don't repay evil for evil. In Lamentations 3, 30-32, it says, He gives his cheek to him that smites him. He is filled with reproach, for the Lord will not cast far forever. But though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. you always got to keep reading. Okay? And it always helps if you understand some Hebrew here because the Hebrew word translated as smite is a is a blow but the the Greek word means to strike with a hand and, it, and there's two different things going on here okay Jesus is saying don't repay evil for evil what he's saying is look if somebody casts an accusation you turn and walk away. And it's kind of interesting because he says if someone strikes your right cheek off of your left, well, if you're facing someone and they want to hit your right cheek and they're right-handed, they're going to do it in a backhanded motion, right? Anyone who has ever been in any type of confrontation as you're standing you don't worry as much about your right side. You protect your left. Especially if the person who is, is confronting you, you know through their actions are right-handed. Your defensive motion is to protect your left. But if they come at you backhanded, it's a little different situation. And what Yeshua is saying is, Look, if they, if they want to backhand you and they want to do things, offer them the back cheek, let's just say. It, it, it's kind of a Hebrewism, and it's almost a sarcastic jab at the person who's provoking you. Because as I said before, if, if you have a problem with someone and both of you are obedient to Torah, you're going to resolve it according to Torah. But if, if you are having conflict with someone who is not observant of Torah 
or who forgets Torah or who just doesn't care. That's where your problem's going to be. And now he's going to start getting into some other things here. Just, just watch and follow along. In verse 40 he says, If any man will sue you at the law and take away thy coat, let him have your cloak also. <clears throat> now this isn't meaning he's suing uh, at Torah. This means he is suing in a civil court. And now in Exodus 22, 26, and 27, If you at all take your neighbor's remnant to pledge, if somebody leaves you their coat as collateral, okay, you're going to give it back to him before the sun goes down because that might be his only covering. It's a remnant for his skin. Where shall he sleep? And he shall, if it comes to pass that he crieth unto me, I'm going to hear it, and I'm gracious. If you don't give him his coat back before nightfall, and he cries out to me, who gets punished? Who gets punished? In Matthew 5.41, Whoever shall compel you to go a mile, go with him too. In Exodus 36.5, uh, they spoke to Moses saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work. They're building the tabernacle. And, and Moses is complaining, they're bringing too much. They're bringing too much. And, and that is the precedent that is set. If you ask for something, you always bring more than you need. Now, it's interesting that Leviticus 5.15 says, If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord, ram without blemish of his flocks. For with thy estimation by shekels of silver, after the shekel of the sanctuary, for a trespass offering. Now, the requirement here is if you sinned and you had to, to, to make up to somebody, you gave them an extra fifth of the value. Okay? You gave them a fifth of the value additional to what you wronged them. So if you sinned by killing someone's $100 ram, okay, you brought the ram plus $20 in silver. You, you repaid plus a, an addition. And that's where this comes from. If somebody wrongs with you and says, you're going with me, well, just go the extra mile. That's where we get the, the saying, go the extra mile comes from. But it is all based on payback. Okay, you always pay forward. You always pay up. The requirement was a fifth, but quite often, because of the Exodus uh, situation we have going on there, you always give more. You always do your best. You always give more. Verse forty-two: Give to him that asked you, <clears throat> and from him that would borrow. Don't turn him away. In Psalm 37, 21, The wicked borrow and payeth not again, but the righteous show mercy and gives. Proverbs 21, 26, He coveteth greedily all day long, but the righteous giveth and spare not. Deuteronomy 15, 7 and 8, If there be among you a poor man of one of the brethren, within any of your gates, in the land which the Lord God giveth you, you will not harden your heart. Nor shut your hand out, or ne nor shut your hand from the poor. Excuse me. But you will open your hand wide to him, and you will surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wants. Now, this is specifically speaking, and I'm not going to get into you know this is in the land, but this is in general. You be kind. You be gracious. If somebody needs something, you give it to them. I have heard people today, there was a, a gentleman who had to go back to Israel for a period of time, and, and he said the one thing that really 
amazes him is the generosity of the people there. He needed a place to stay, and they're like, yeah, here's a room. Well, how, how long can I stay? As long as you need it. Okay? It's the generosity of the people. And that should carry over into our lives as well. <clears throat> In verse 43, we see, You have heard it said, You will love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Leviticus 19.18, You will not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you will love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Where's the hate your enemy part? Where, where is the hate your enemy part? Can you find it in any of the scriptures? No, you can't. It's not there. Verse 44, Yeshua says, But I say, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, why would he say this? Is it something new? Of course, it's nothing new. Psalm 7, 4, and 5, If I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, Yes, I have delivered him without cause as mine enemy. Let the enemy persecute my soul and let it, yes, let him tread down my life upon the earth and lay my honor in the dust. Wow. If I have wrongfully accused and made an enemy wrongfully, then let them overtake me. Job 31, 29, 30. If I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me or lifted myself up when evil found him, neither have I suffered from my mouth to sin by wishing a curse on his soul. Uh-oh. If I rejoice at the destruction of him that hated me or lifted myself up when evil found him. Now, that's back in Job. That's before Torah was given. This is around Abraham's time. Okay? Uh, Matthew 40, uh, 5, 45, 46, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do, you, do not even the publicans do the same? Don't the politicians love each other, is what he's saying here. Now in 1 Samuel... 24, 17, and he said to David, now this is Saul speaking to David, King Saul speaking to David, you are more righteous than I am, for you have rewarded me good, and I have rewarded you evil. You see what we're getting at here. You see where we're headed. Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Don't hate your enemy. You, you don't... Now, this doesn't mean you have to hold hands and sit around the campfire singing Kumbaya. That's not what it means. That's not what it's getting at here. Okay? What it's getting at here is something deeper. You treat them with respect and humanity. You treat them with... Even though you might not get along, does it mean if you're in the same room, you, you, you're battling? No, it means if you're in the same room, you, you do what it takes to get along. As long as he's doing the same thing, or she. What, what he's getting at here is so much deeper than the world today. Because the world today says... If I don't like that person, I have a right to destroy that person. Emotionally, physically, however I want to do it. What Yeshua is saying is, no, you don't have the right to destroy that person. You have the right to give that person a drink of water if he's thirsty. You have a right to feed that person if he's hungry. You have a responsibility to show compassion even to the people you don't like being around. Okay, We have a responsibility. Like I said, it doesn't mean we have to be buddy-buddy. It doesn't mean we have to sit around the campfire holding hands and singing Kumbaya. It simply means we treat each other with respect, compassion, and humanity. 
Is that really that difficult to do? Matthew 40, or chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. <clears throat> Boy, this really goes together. For if you love them which love you, where's your reward in that? The politicians even do it. If you salute your brother only, what do you, what's he more than anybody else? The politicians love each other. They get along. They do things. Okay? That's what he's saying. In Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my people. You will be, I'm sorry, you will be a particular treasure to me. I'm thinking of a different verse. Then you will be a particular treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you will be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the children of Israel, Moses. If you obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you're going to be a special treasure to me. I, I had a discussion not too long ago about does God loves everybody exactly the same? Apparently not, according to Exodus chapter 19. Because if we obey him and listen to him and do the things he's telling us to do, then we are a special treasure. Why are we that special treasure? Because then we become the example to the rest of the world. We become the example to the rest of the world. Can I say that again? We are the example to the rest of the world. What good does it do us if we sit in our churches and talk about how good we are, what great things we're doing, if we're only doing them for ourselves? Now, there are people who, who go out into the streets in the name of, and I, I yeah, I'm going to say in the name of their church. And Yeshua gets into that when he starts writing the letter to, I believe it's Smyrna in Revelation chapter 3. And he says, look, yeah, you've done good work, but you've made a name for yourselves. Who are we supposed to be making a name for? If we are called by his name, we get the family name. If we only do the things that the world does, then, then we're just a social club with a bunch of good ideas. And what good is it? Because even the politicians do that. Even the politicians do that. But we are called to show compassion. We're called to sh display humanity. We're called for something completely different. To be an example to the world. To take the instructions that God gives us to live by and display that to the rest of the world. Are we doing our job? Seriously, are we doing our job? Or are we simply displaying it to each other? We feel good about each other when we get around ourselves. Oh, I'm sitting in this pew. Isn't it a wonderful day? Well, no, it's not a wonderful day. Because there are people out there who desire that connection. Their spirit is crying out to connect with the Holy Spirit of the Almighty. And they need our example. They need our example of doing what Yeshua is speaking about. Using Him as our example. Next time we're going to get into Matthew chapter 6, but between now and then the Feast of Sukkot is coming up and I will have a special teaching. And that special teaching is going to include the question, should we keep the feast of the Lord? Do we observe the feast? Why do Christians observe the feast? But I'm going to turn that question around. And the question I'm going to answer is, when did the church stop observing the Feast of the Almighty. I think you will enjoy it. I know I'm having a lot of fun putting it together. 
and I hope you will give it a listen. Thank you, and shalom. <laughs>